the learning hack is supported by a new spring, the platform that puts the learner first, shaping journeys that help individuals learn faster and perform better. Access intelligent technology, profound insights and a unique network of like-minded pioneers. And if you're a trainer or training provider looking to succeed in this fast-changing market, their free ebook will show you how putting the learner first is the key to winning. Download it now at anewspring.com slash learner first. That's anewspring.com slash learner first. Oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface, and a huge workforce crews and manages the ships that sail on them. These people all have to be trained. As you can imagine, it's a very different thing from training office workers or retail staff, but exactly how different? This time on The Learning Hack, we're taking a deep dive into maritime. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning. I'm learning. Learning is fun. Knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Learning. Before the advent of digital learning, training was a fragmented and parochial industry. Companies tended to be small and highly specific to a particular area or business sector. The internet changed all that. Learn tech companies now largely work across those divides, but you can still find sectors where the learning needs are so niche and specific that meeting them calls for a specialist. Maritime is one of those, and this time we're talking to someone who definitely is a specialist and knows the sector inside out. Kate Fitzgerald had a fact. Who is this proud oceaneer? Raul Harris is Chief Creative Officer at Ocean Technologies Group, a global organisation providing software, content and services to the maritime industry. With a degree in English Literature and Drama and a background in Multimedia, Raul is a creative thinker with a passion for education, technology and creating delightful experiences for maritime professionals. Interviewing Raul certainly was a delightful experience, but Jay Curtis, Head of Themes... What themes did we cover? John, considering your usual style of interviewing, I thought you were remarkably restrained with your nautical puns in this interview. Yes, I sailed through it. You cover the differences between maritime and other sectors thoroughly. Raleigh is well anchored by his knowledge of the sector. Oh, good grief. You talked about the green transition as it affects shipping. Choppy waters to navigate. Will you just stop? And you talked about how his company, Ocean, has come together through acquisition. It's really making waves in the industry. I shouldn't have said anything, should I? It's all too easy to make airy generalisations about learning. But when you look at the challenges faced by real organisations in a sector as specific and individual as maritime, it can make you think again. Learning is never one thing. And the world of learning is bigger and more diverse than we often consider. (laughs) So, Ralph, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, welcome to the Learning Hack. Well, it's great, great to be here as, as a listener to your your good podcast. I'm, I'm it's a great privilege to be to be a part of it. So, glad to be here. You say all the right things. <laughs> Your chief creative officer at Ocean Technologies Group, the largest learning provider to the maritime industry. Can you tell us a bit about maritime, uh, a sector we perhaps don't think of very often until a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal and suddenly there's no food on the supermarket shelves? How important is maritime to global business? Well, it's absolutely vital. And it is one of those kind of areas that sort of... Uh, not not as well known as it should be, a little bit under the radar. Um, but 90% of everything that's traded in the world comes on a, on a ship. So everything you eat, everything you wear, uh, the fuel to heat your home uh, and energy, et cetera, all comes from uh, from ships. And it's a, it's a truly global business. So it's connecting far-flung places all over the world, lots of different nationalities and so on. It's around... Uh, I think 432 billion contributor to to GDP. 
employs nearly 2 million people working at sea and 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 I tried to find the numbers of people working at shore but it's such a there's so many roles that connect with it it's very difficult to kind of come up with a figure on that so it's a very diverse sector in the sense that it's actually a number of sort of different um businesses that are all sort of connected so different trades between wet cargo dry cargo container ships cruise for example is probably the most different one um as an area. So we think of it as one industry. Sometimes it's actually many interdependent industries, I think. Yeah. And I think that's got a kind of specificity of the industry as well as the the diversity of it has a lot of effect on the trading and, and we'll get into that as we, we go yeah. through this, I think. But first of all, how did you get into the sector and into learning more specifically beyond that? So did you set a course for where you are now? See what we're doing there? Uh, right back <laughs> in school and stick to it um, in your navigation? Or has the compass rolled around a bit on the way? Did you always want to be a seafarer? I don't think I really ever had a compass at all for most of the journey, and it's all been entirely accidental. I think as in the, the, the last part of your question is an interesting one, because I think I always think I had, you know, I had relatives in, in the distant past who'd been seafarers and and. Um, and I always sort of loved the romance of that, you know, the, the idea of travel and stuff like that. But I hadn't I'd certainly never thought or knew anything about the shipping industry. I fell also fell not only into into the shipping industry, I also fell in really into the learning industry by accident as well. So my background was in um, in media, really. I was working at the time on a lot of sort of the viral games you know the flash games and that kind of thing and i was lecturing at a university in london on on interaction design and on computer games design within that i, I had experience of teaching and i had experience of writing course material and designing learning for people for face to face learning and and i also had a lot of experience with nationalities different nationalities from i, I taught english as a foreign language when i first left university and so on and so so all of those things kind of came together um really when I answered a, a, just an ad in a newspaper for a company which was called Videotel, who were the leader in maritime learning and, and obviously very heavily video based at that time. And they were sort of transitioning into being an interactive business. So they, they wanted someone to come in and help to shape that. And and so it was it was as, as simple as if I'd have missed the that little advert in the newspaper and uh, then, you know, none of this may have happened. So really all by accident. But having sort of joined and got into it and found more and more about it I've, I've i've always felt very much at home and part of you know uh, connected to it which is kind of strange i don't know why but it had a great affinity for me uh, in the genes i should say that the, the helmers i come from a long line of seafarers and sea captains who became insurance brokers in the city much less interesting and i feel a similar affinity to the sector which is entirely sentimental and made up <laughs> rubbish well i think you know i think it's probably it's part of part of the way shipping's evolved i suppose as well i think in in the past it would have been much more present in and much more in front of people you know you would be on the dock side waiting for the ship to come in with the things that you needed and you'd be very much conscious and aware of it i think the supply chains have changed and yeah. it's all been obscured a little bit i think as well yeah yeah interesting that and i grew up on the estuary and you know we're very aware of places like tilbury to get across yeah to Kent and so on, and and, uh, and the amount of traffic that there was coming in and out of the industry. So my perception is that learning in the maritime context has a lot of differences from the mainstream of training. It's interesting because my, my, you know, my career has been in kind of learning um, mostly in the, the workplace context, and then you come to maritime and, and the training world there is very different, both in terms of what has to be learned and also in the ways in which it's supported by technology now. And I think it would be really interesting for people who follow this podcast to find out about some of those differences. Can you walk us through some of the major reasons for them? Give us a flavor of the uniqueness of the sector. And I know there are issues like con connectivity, ship ownerships. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think primarily it is very different. It, the, the sort of problems are very different. And I, I'll kind of give you a few of those. And and everything is sort of um, it's much less cookie cutter, you know. There's it's much more bespoke, and I know mo there's a lot of bespoke development that happens in the the wider e-learning world, and so people will say, oh, it's the same everywhere. But there's the intrinsic differences, I think, to shipping, particularly in the way that accounts need to be structured and administrated. So you don't have this normal 
company employee relationship often there's there's different um parts of the businesses which have you know come together and are being held separately so you may want some people to have admin rights over very uh, of one smaller subset of it you get uh, this attachment of um you don't have this sort of attachment in locations in the same way that you do so people aren't working in an office you know this is a mobile workforce a kind of workforce that's on the move um, and it's and it's often as well, there are different models to that. So there are people who have long term relationships with their employees and others where it's much more contractual, you know, much more transactional. And sometimes even within the same company, they may have that for one and one part of the business, but another is a more stable crewing model. You've got people who are specializing in manning and, and crewing. Sometimes you've got owners. Owners may then put the ship under technical management, which means that the manager is now responsible for, for the training. Uh, and that kind of thing. And they may do some and some, you know, they may have some ships, they manage themselves and they would be looking after the, the learning and then they would be, uh, you know, having other parts of it. So being able to take account of all those things is, is, is extremely complicated and it affects the way in which the schedules are created of what the, the training matrix, if you like, of what different people are doing uh, and that kind of thing. That remote workforce also comes with lots of other challenges as well. So increasingly now we're thinking about how you support things like mental health and well-being. There was some, you know, in the within the pandemic, for example, seafarers were really impacted because some of them spent as long as 13 months trapped on a on a ship because they, they couldn't get off. And then a lot of them who, who wanted to work couldn't get get to where they needed to work. And that's that's had a lasting impact. Um, you mentioned connectivity. Obviously, that's a massive change as well. So you you have to from a technology point of view, you have to break a lot of rules to get things to work, you know, in terms of having the same two data held in two places at the same time, sort of fundamental rule that you shouldn't uh, shouldn't break. But you need that because you're going to have situations where people are offline. And that sort of online, offline model, I think a lot of your listeners will say, well, then we well, just have mobile apps, don't you? That's surely what you do. But it, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. There's a need to actually administrate the learning as well at a, a local installation level which may have patchy connectivity or no co connectivity at all so distribution is a is a key thing in there about how you actually get new material out to the user um you know when you, you've got a sort of leverage where you can digital delivery but still still a lot of it's analog you know still a lot of usb sticks flying around the world and and being taken to, to vessels so all of those things are, are, are challenges as well um, and then the other thing to say is it's it's a very compliance driven industry, which is good in terms of having good drivers and that sort of stuff. It's very heavily legislated, but that legislation can move very quickly. There's lots of different sources. I mean, overall kind of international le agreed legislation is still pretty slow, but there's a lot of best practice guidance, a lot of uh, charterers requirements. So people who who would be the customers of our customers, if, if you like, you know, they're issuing updates all the time. So there's a lot to update. You've got to watch a lot of uh, multiple inputs and that kind of thing. And then the last thing I think is is probably a big difference from a lot of uh, the rest of the industry as well. It's, it's an extremely you know, cost conscious uh, industry. The margins are very, very small. The scale is, is big. So every, every penny sort of counts. So it, there's probably a much lower expectation of what would pay for individual head of learning uh compared to what people would perhaps factor in on land yeah there's a couple of things in there actually it occurs to me make it a bit similar to retail but then other things just completely different mm. could you talk about the um the particular character of the workforce um a, a very high percentage of people who work on ships come from manila is that right well, from the Philippines, uh, more generally, um, yeah, about a quarter, something like that. Uh, it's, it's a huge, um, huge contributor has been for for many years, yeah, and um, uh, and and that's the model. You know, I mentioned it about being a cost conscious industry. It's always trying to find um, cheap labor to work with, uh, cheap but good labor, obviously. And um, yeah, Philippines has found a real niche there in terms of being. Um, being uh, gearing up to satisfy the world's need for seafarers and yeah clearly it's very globalized and that also has comes into it when you look at kind of ship ownership and um, i write in saying that ships can be kind of owned in one country and then registered in a completely different country so the so the kind of jurisdictions that they fall under can be very different from yeah more complicated situation there with say you know if you yeah it, it's it's uh it, it's true and 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 layers of ownership as well in terms of you know when when 
uh, when you're looking at things like sanctions and so on, you have to be very, very careful to make sure that the ownership, you know, is is not sort of held elsewhere and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you, you referred to the flags, the flag situation. So this is where a ship may be owned in one country, but the, the, they may decide to to flag that ship as being under another administration somewhere very far away, um, because that the the regulations that apply to that or the, the governance of that uh, are more suitable to the way they want to do um, business, let's put it that way. And I think one of the things that's probably quite an eye opener is that when you actually sort of get into the shipping world is there is no such thing as international law. There is only internationally agreed law, which is put in force by local administrations. So there's this, this sort of hugely kind of you know cooperative uh, thing that needs to happen around agreeing that legislation with all the kind of vested interests that you might have mm. and protectionism that might go on you know for for all sorts of reasons so there's you know there's always that sort of slight gap between the spirit of what everyone's trying to achieve and what everybody will write into their to their local laws um but yes typically i mean it, it's 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 not unusual for for some of these um for these different flags to be favored as well by different sectors and will operate under that so when you when you're looking to get your learning approved so that it can be accepted as a uh, as a c- certificate of training so there's there's sort of role based courses which somebody might do and you want to get those you know you you need those to be recognized by different administrations that's when it comes down to well, who is the flag with and that may change as well. Ships do get reflagged as well. Um, but but you're typically sort of looking to kind of to those flags to sort to set out what is permissible in terms of how you can conduct and deliver learning and to what standard. Well, you mentioned that you had done some language learning as a, a as a trainer. Um, and to zero in on that particular area of maritime training, I believe language learning is really important in the industry and and very distinct in its requirements can you talk a bit about that yeah so uh you, and you're right i mean uh, english is sort of the language of the sea it's the sort of the the lingua franca if you like of of uh, of how it should be um but that's not mandated unless what's mandated is that the safety management system which is the kind of you know the what the the, the vessel will be governed by from a safety point of view um it, that that needs to be in if there's a mixed nationality crew then that that needs to be in english and so people therefore need to be speaking english so you in other words if you if you're running in uh, with an all all chinese nationality crew you could have your china you know you could have your sms in chinese and then that wouldn't be an issue but you know as i said before it's a it's a global international workforce and typically the, the typically those are mixed crews and therefore there's a there's a common language of english and you can imagine how important it is to, from a communications point of view on board the ship, you know, vital things, people being able to communicate what's happening in terms of all the other sort of ships as they're navigating seaways, cargo operations, which are potentially very dangerous. You don't want to have anybody involved in that that does that misunderstands what somebody else's instruction is that, that that's saying that. And so we have a we have something called the Marlins English language test, which is because it's kind of interesting. There isn't a sort of globally you know there are global english language standards from tefl and so on but those those don't really apply in maritime so the 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 standard that we have there is the de facto standard for the industry the marlins english language test is most recognized and so on and that's really important that people are doing that test before they go uh, to actually understand you know can they can they uh, recognize uh can they are they going to be able to deal with the communications and stuff that they that they have when they're on board um, so there's a real safety angle attached to that. You've then got on top of that a lot of um, maritime English as well, which is the standard communication phrases that people would be expected to understand and to know. And those are those might be challenging for the average English speaker, you know, as well, if you don't know what they are and what they mean. So that's another factor, too. But I think one of the other things that's interesting and that we talk about a lot more now is when you actually think I mentioned earlier, the sort of mental health crisis, and then you look at things like uh, ESG, where you're looking to kind of to be measured on a much broader sort of range as, uh, of how you, you treat your people in the S part of, of ESG. And then, you know, you've then got to sort of start to say, well, 
what kind of level of English language do I need to ensure that good communication is coming place that's subtle, that's able to evaluate, you know, where someone's head is at mentally and 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 uh, and to build a, a spirit of cohesion and to and to build a welcoming, diverse place to try and kind of get, you know, uh, as we try to welcome more more women into the industry. So um, so I, I you know, we're, we're sort of pushing for, for that higher language skills to be there and to people to take that side of things much more seriously because if you are serious about building uh those vocabularies um you know uh, that that kind of workplace environment you're going to need people to have a much wider vocabulary and then when we also talk about vocabulary there's a huge amount of tech coming into the business as well mm. and a lot of things that people need to understand there as well so i think that's another area where where sort of technology language terms and you know those kind of things are coming into play as well yeah, so standardization really important, but there, there, there's also another layer on top of that to do with ESG, which I think people will be more familiar about in in the general kind of corporate mainstream of it. But but there is this, as you say, there's this huge requirement for for having common terms and language and all those weird terms that people on boats use, like I don't know, speak up. <laughs> Well, yeah, there, there, there's there's a hell of a lot of them, and they describe situations as well, and how, you know how to recognise different conditions and and so on. Um, there's yeah. some great, some very colourful stuff in in shipping as well, an enormous amount of. I heard some very colourful language from uh, a guy in my bike group who was in the merchant navy for years. I mean, his language is extremely colourful. Yes, I can imagine. But I meant I was meaning more along the lines of some of the terms. There's some wonderful terms in there. I'll, I'll give you one: the monkey's fist. If you have any thoughts on what the monkey's fist might be, I'm kind of feeling trepidatious about asking you to tell me what that is. <laughs> well, this is a family podcast, I know, so I've chosen one that's deliberately inoffensive. The monkey's fist is a is a sort of a ball which has a, a line attached to it, and it's when you want to get the mooring rope to land uh, to bring the ship in and so the mooring that the mooring line is very heavy as you'd expect to pull a great big ship but the line that's attached that gives you the to be able to pull on the rope uh this is where the monkey's fist comes in and you can throw that across to the to the port side and then they can start to get the line in so that's the monkey's fist folks yes The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. Our previous guest on the podcast was from Shell, a um, bit of a handbrake turn of a change of subject here. Um, he talked a bit about the green transition. And I know that um, you, you've said publicly that decarbonizing shipping is the biggest challenge of our generation. Can you talk about the issues, uh, particular to maritime, driving this, uh, new fuels and technologies and the needs that it's throwing up for training? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a subject very close to my heart and something I'm working on um, on on a, on a weekly basis. And and yeah, there's a few reasons why why I say that. I mean, I think decarbonisation more broadly, you know, this is this is the the challenge of our lifetime. But shipping, most people probably are unaware of what a massive part shipping sort of can play in that. So, as a, if shipping were a country, if the industry was a country, it'd be the sixth biggest emitter of, of GHC uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, that's a sort of, wow, you know, this is one of the reasons why people look to shipping as being part of the problem. But it's also a very energy efficient uh, way of transporting goods, the most energy efficient in a sense. So, you know, if if we were to take shipping out of the equation there, the emissions of all those other countries would go through the roof. So it's a sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the problem, but also part of the solution. So we have very ambitious targets to decarbonize the, the industry, reaching net zero in, in, in 2050 and some some targets which can't be missed in 2030 to the, that will ultimately get us there. And so this, this the time window is closing um, you know, very, very sharply. And there's a huge uh, number of things that need to happen within that for to, to, to get it right. So you've got, you know, 
you've got sort of replacement of world fleet with with a whole bunch of ships being junked and a lot of others being retrofitted and so on that, that to be able to, to to get us there to switch to as you say to these new um greener fuels and the one one and then alongside that you, there's a huge amount of infrastructure work that needs to happen as well so you know it's a little bit like those of you switching to electric cars will know you've got to have places that you can actually you can actually charge your car at the different destinations and stuff that you want to go to before you would be prepared to commit to, to, to buying one of those. So imagine that on a shipping scale where you've got sort of, you know, so many ports in the world and so many, you know, you've got predictable trades like container liners. So we know we're going from A to B on a regular basis, but there's also what we call the tramp market, which is where you're, you you don't know necessarily where you're going to go or the spot market. So it's hugely, hugely complicated thing to do. But if we just zoom in on the the sort of from the learning angle, it's this switch to multiple new fuel types, I think, is the issue. So you've got a situation from where most of the ships in the world today are fueled by heavy fuel oils and all the seafarers that work on those ships know and understand what that means. We have some ships that are LNG powered um, at the moment and other ships coming on stream with methanol and things like that. But the the the, the future of the energy market in the, is is such that there won't be one fuel of the future there's going to be a mix of hydrogen ammonia methanol um and uh and batteries for some sort of short sea uh, kind of stuff as well and the typical thing about all those new fuels is that they're all more dangerous than working with hfo they all they're all going to require a much higher safety profile than is than is required so you 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 mentioned shell there you know shell are obviously used to working to very very exacting standards because they operate oil tankers and gas ships and this kind of thing and they have they have a very uh, very mature safety culture etc so for companies like that, it's going to be less of a stretch than it is for some of the the rest of the world fleet. And so, fundamentally, the the number of seafarers that will need to be retrained in that in the in the work that uh, is going on at the moment is estimated in the region of about eight hundred thousand different seafarers, you know, seafarers who will need some sort of retraining and reskilling. So it's a it's a massive industry, a massive kind of skills piece to the industry is what the focus up until now has been largely about you know how are we going to make this technically achievable how are we going to make enough of the fuel in, in and so on um, but i'm pleased that now the debate has moved very very firmly to being um you know what how are we going to get the the workforce um able to do this and it's going to be an enormous enormous task um and as i said not only for how do I handle this fuel safely, um, but also, you know, how do we raise the overall safety culture to work responsibly um, uh, like that? And the other, the last thing to say is around like sort of, yeah, so shipping, as I said, has that sort of emissions itself, which which are part part of the, the, the solution. Um, but it's also when you start to look at how green fuels are going to be developed and where they're going to be developed, you know, a lot of it is going to be happening in the global South, much of the, um, you know, so much of the energy and the fuels that are then made to make that energy transferable from power, from solar, from wind, that's going to be moved by ships. And I think at least 50% of that will be, be being moved by ships. So shipping just sim simply, we cannot as a planet decarbonize without the shipping industry. That's so interesting. And I heard just the other day on a podcast that, um, you know, the existing fuels you're talking about, um, three years ago, uh, there was a ruling that came in that you couldn't have sulfur in those fuels anymore because the, the fuels that go in ships are, are a lot dirtier than the ones that are allowed on land. Um, and they contain things like sulfur. So sulfur was banned, it's taken out of, out of the fuels. Uh, and they found that this actually had an adverse effect. It, it's created a warming effect because a lot of the sulfur fumes blocked out sunlight and the sea is now beginning to warm slightly more, it seems, because of having cleaned up the, 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 the fuels from shipping. So it's an uncertain future, isn't it? Because there are all these kind of, un you know, that's not an argument for saying that we shouldn't take you know, nasty things out of the fuels, but but there there is a lot of kind of um, unforeseen consequences in in this world going forward, isn't there? And you can see a huge amount not only for of need for training and retraining, but a responsive training effort for for those issues as they come up. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's interesting. I haven't heard that one specifically, but there are typically, you know, there are typically consequences to um, to quite often the, the you know unintended consequences to changing this. And legislation isn't always, you know, I mentioned that it, it's a factor and it, the constant updates and so on. And, and this is the thing in the regulation uh, of these, people are trying to find the most effective ways of measuring, you know, um, these. So we have some some very complex indices that are to work out who are the most uh, emitting ships. And they and they don't always favour really efficacious behaviour. You know, sometimes they it, it's a it's it's a bit like sort of when they, we try and set these things up in the workplace to motivate people to do stuff. And then they, they end up finding a way around it that actually makes it worse. Um, so I don't think we've got the right energy efficiency measures uh, always in, in place. And so, you, you know, you have to then wait and see what's the outcome of that. And then suddenly, you know, you're looking at that again um, uh, and then adjusting that and then looking at, at that. There's also the legislative picture. There's a lot of other things coming in as well, which are making things more complicated, like, for example, emissions trading schemes and things like that. You know, there's that slight, you know, slight fragmentation between what EU, EU are doing versus what other parts of the world are doing and stuff. And it's, so, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier about sort of tracking multiple inputs and that kind of thing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's 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 really important not to look too much at things in isolation because they increasingly sort of, you know, coming up against one another. And I think one of the, the other things that's interesting to me is uh, uh, looking at the new fuels side of things is that there's, it's much more about global supply chain and and, and fuel, you know, the full, when, when you look at it from a skills point of view, I think there's a, there's, there's a huge opportunity for transferable skills within that. So it's much less kind of, oh, you work in maritime, you work in the shore side. I think it will start to break down a little bit in terms of people's experience and with working with these different fuels. Because as you say, in the past, heavy fuel oil was something very, very different. This big, thick, tarry substance that nobody else had anything to do with when it comes to clean hydrogen, methanol. So, you know, this is going to be much more distributed, I think. So plenty of uh, work in the future for the company you work for, Ocean. If we can focus on that company for a while, Ocean didn't exist before a few years ago, but the components of which it's made up, many of them have a final heritage. And Videotel, the company that you're talking about, you first came into, is one of those. So Ocean's come is a number of brands coming together. Can you describe how the company came together and what its current focus is? Sure. Um, so I, I mentioned Videotel that I started working with in, in 2004, um, and that had really been the first player in this in a very niche space. You know, it, it started in the in the 70s, you know, with reels of film and actually transporting projectors and reels of film uh, onto ships, evolving there into sort of, you know, box of DVDs, which would go out there and then, you know, and then to a digital sort of and then into an LMS. And the two big players there were, were Seagull and Videotel. So Seagull came in after after Videotel, a little bit more focus on on the on the on the platform side of it, and um, and those two were both come under common ownership in 2019, and that really then sort of started the ball rolling on a new thing to be sort of born out out of that, as well as bringing in some other brands into that mix as well. Some of which were were also in the learning and assessment space so i mentioned marlins earlier that the real the real sort of uh leading part there was the was the the marlins english language test was a real differentiator there but they also had a, a very good pay-as-you-go courses business um there as well so that's kind of slightly changed the focus but it was the the other brands that came into the picture particularly i think for listeners here would be interested in the crew management platform that, that we brought in the brand um compass which uh, which was a which is a, a, essentially a maritime hr platform that takes into account all those considerations that I, that I mentioned earlier in terms of the way companies are structured and employees are sort of handled you know sort of um lots of very you know the real complexities there over and above what people would normally expect is travel is an enormous part of it as you get crew to different places so travel visas all those kind of things employment agreements different unions and all that kind of stuff so that's sort of you know and then and then alongside that a fleet management business which is um really sort of looking at how maintenance tasks are done how, how purchases are made for different parts of equipment and stuff within and an hseq uh, part of that as well so that's really about how you're kind of auditing and how you're kind of 
uh, approaching your whole kind of safety management. So all of those things together um, gave us a much broader focus. And I'd say what was kind of interesting for me as someone who'd worked in learning and learning development for, for, for a long time is understanding where each of those elements connects and where, you know, where um, what's actually driving some of the behaviors that you had seen in, in learning and some of the choices that were people were making in their learning and how that then relates to their overall business. So, so today, I think really, when you talk about where, where we sit, we're, we're really, it's a, it's about human capital management. I think fundamentally we're looking at how we kind of uh, how we can kind of help organizations to really get their people performing, I think. Yeah. So if you're coming from a kind of, corporate training background and, and you're used to things like the LMS, the talent management system, um, various other bits of HR software. There's a kind of equivalence there, isn't there, in, in your crew solution with a with a talent management system, but but it it it's different. I mean what 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 are the similarities, what are the differences when you look at the mainstream software market? Well, I, I think it's hard for me to to sort of pinpoint those, having only really worked in uh, the 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 maritime sector. But I think that the you know it, a lot of the frameworks are universal and agreed. So whereas different companies will will sort of um, like something like a competency management. I know you and I have spoken about competency management systems before because I think they're, they're sort of the learning. Uh, industry perhaps has moved more away from those those are still and probably even more relevant uh in in our world because you do have this ranks based approach and that doesn't really exist i think in outside of maritime this idea that people are, are at a certain rank as an officer and either as an engineer or as a, as a deck officer you know and there are different proficiencies which are absolutely nailed on and will probably be they can be prescribed by their company but there's also an enormous amount of guidance produced by sort of industry tastemakers and and, and uh, NGO trade bodies, that kind of thing that are, that are setting out universal standards to that. So, um, so, so I think having that structure and being very kind of formulaic, if you like, is something that's unique to our industry that, that you would find multiple companies all, all aligning around a single sort of, you know, way of managing and uh, their, their people in that regard. Uh, and then, as as I mentioned as well, you've got things that are very specific to to the trade that they're in. So, depending on you know the the, the tanker world, the, you know they, they all have their own bespoke sort of ways of doing it. Which I don't I don't think that kind of structure exists in the broader um, world really. Uh, so I think th those are you know those are the principal differences. And then I think as well, there's a lot. There's probably a lot more that needs to happen at local level. You know, I think that's. That's a, when you talk about maritime HR, it's not like in a company where you have your HR professionals and they're dealing with all HR matters, if you like, and they might be dealing with all the development side of it, or they might have a team that's that's sort of, you know, designing the talent program or whatever. Um, in, in our world, that needs to be much more delegated to to, to a, a local level. So you're often asking somebody who's who's not an HR professional to play an HR role. Uh, to conduct an appraisal, to conduct, you know, to to oversee learning and development. It's very much sort of just a part of, a very small part of a, of a wide job they have to do rather than something that they're dedicated to. But the success of them doing it well is absolutely crucial, so. Yeah, so coming back to, to, to what you said about the ranking system being quite rigid in, in that sense, it's a bit more like defence as a sector. You know, I'm trying to yeah. put out these comparisons to other sectors like retail and defense and so on just to as, as a way of helping people get their their heads around it but yeah on the learning systems level it is it's quite a specialized beast you know mm. in other words telling people all about the maritime sector all the vendors who are listening to this podcast and i know we have a lot of vendors are not going to think wow here's a sector we can get into tomorrow lads and um eat oceans lunch because you need that depth of experience of the sector to really work there don't you yeah, I mean, uh, yes, it's a very it's a very difficult set to to break into. It's very very heavily um, linked through to the relationships and to the uh, to the sort of the history of of having proved your your chops, if you like, in that because people need to, you know this is very life and death stuff, and people need to really know and recognize that you're you know you're uh, 
you as a vendor and as a as a as a um, contributor to the industry. Um, but also as well, I think it's 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 really good to or really important to understand that the the kind of the complexities of actually the material and the solution that you need to provide. So it's not so common that you're in a situation whereby you're you're having a relationship with the customer and you're saying to them, well, what would you like? You know, what would you like to see? And kind of, these, these people typically don't have the time for that. You know, they're looking to work with somebody who already knows what the solution is, who's able to recommend exactly what they need to run their trade and that they have the right material hand and ready to go to meet all of the different requirements um, that there are. And, and also as well, it's one of those things that you, it's sort of, it's a very difficult industry to serve a bit of, or to do a little bit because doing a little bit of it is not really that helpful. You know, you need to have the comprehensive solution in place um, so that you're able to solve multiple problems simultaneously, because the one thing people don't want is a really fragmented um vendor relationship where they go to this person for this and this person for another you know it's too it's too complex really for that so so i think that that, those are the kind of um things to to think about i I mentioned the ranks and the roles thing the the content and having specific content for specific vessels and specific operations and then there's that online hybrid model that i think trips a lot of people up as well is that they, they they often don't understand how complex that needs to be in terms of the sort of maturity i suppose you're often dealing with vessels you're often dealing with a, a less than ideal technical setup there in terms of what's available to you and how what, what you can run locally yeah well i think for a e-learning old hands this will say well it's like go, they're, they're, they'll be saying to themselves it's like going back 10 years 15 years when we used to have you know when connectivity wasn't so quite so universal it's not universal but not quite so universal as it is on the mainland and you know we have the cloud has has, has emerged as a really important thing um it, it's kind of different that and some of the other things that you've mentioned would tend to make you feel like the thing about competencies versus you know on the in the kind of you know the onshore type of uh sectors would be looking at things like skills taxonomies and so on as a, as a step to move on to. It's making it feel like you're a few years behind in um, maritime. I mean, I know that's not necessarily the case, is it? But it will feel to some like, you know, there, there's a kind of lag here. How do you kind of address that? When you look at the mainstream, how do you kind of benchmark what's happening in maritime against that? Because presumably there are areas where it's more advanced others where it it seems to lag yeah yeah i think i think your observation is a good one i think a lot of people looking at it would would say that and certainly i said that when i came in in 2004 it felt very much like it was still the 80s or something then so so i think um i think there's some truth to that i think the thing is it's about it's also about, as I said, a very broad sector. So you will have some people in there who are who are ahead, who are uh, are, are sort of extremely creative and doing doing great technical things that would would blow people's socks off. And then there's people right at the other end who you know we've had to who would still love to just stick with DVDs, you know, and not do anything more than that. So it's 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 a very mixed picture. You do have to typically operate to the lowest common denominator as well, particularly if you're working with a fleet. And as I mentioned as well, with the ship management structure, the, the, the person may not also be in control of what they get. You know, so they, they, they take a ship on into management and it's set up with what it's set up with and they make the best of it and 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 so on. So. So you're typically kind of like a lot of the discussions that you have in um, in, in in maritime end up with sort of yes, but you know, there's always a, a but. It's, it's, so I think I've got it now. It works like this, right? Yes, but you know, there's a, there's always one way you've got to allow for that. And and I think that yes, that that perhaps kind of is frustrating. But then there are also some very creative solutions that then come out of that, you know, and 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 bold technology choices that you need to make to be able to to overcome some of those constraints so yeah uh, there was another point that you you made in there i can't quite remember what it was there but but like how does it how how do you innovate in a in a sort of a slightly retrograde environment i suppose is your 
Yes. And do you feel like you have to, when, when you go to a show like Learning Technologies in London, for instance, and, and you look around, uh, you know, this is the kind of state of the art. How do you kind of benchmark against that? And is it like, oh, this bit be useful for us. That bit's no good because con- because connectivity, that bit's no good for workforce or whatever. What's that experience like for you looking at a show like that? Uh, normally, I, I mean, I mean um, th- there's there's very little that you see that you can't find some way of uh, of emulating it's just more complicated uh, more complicated and you're dealing with a smaller subset of the market so from a commercial point of view you've got to you've got a much smaller base from which to to monetize it so so sometimes that can be prohibitive because you think well what we'd have to charge to actually do our version of that would just be you know it, it wouldn't fly kind of thing yeah. um but a lot of it, you know, we've got around a lot of it by being able to create an intellect-like experience on board the vessel. So the, as long as you can get the material to where it needs to be and your software updates there, once it's there, you can serve it and you can do uh, pretty much most of the things that um, that, y- that you can do um, ashore. And then I guess the the other way that we're approaching it is we're we're obviously seeing that the apps are uh, mobile apps give us a great deal more that we can do, which is more similar to to the world. Um, And you still need it to be backed up by other parts, which people can interface that in all the other ways that I mentioned. But it suddenly opens it up. So, for example, you know, working with things that are very plug independent is a bit of a problem in that space because you need a distribution license for the plugin and, and so on and so on. But what we're doing is we're we're finding, so for example, we have some very creative um uh games we've made in Unity, which are which are sort of you know mobile games. We would not be able to deploy them in the infrastructure that we that we would as part of the learning platform on board the vessel. But we can then take those out to the mobile phone so that they can use uh, their own device. They can have advantage of all the different things that can be done within that Unity app space. And we just then, then the challenge for us is how do we then connect that to the rest of what they're doing? And um, and that's really where we can start to really innovate now because we, we, we've moved to, you know, without wanting to go into too much detail, but this idea of sort of microservices and APIs that are all connecting it up so that what's important is all that data picture comes together and people are able to see what's actually happening inside their business. And so we find that that there's a way to break out of some of the constraints by having moving some elements into things like that and into VR, for example, the same. We've got some, some stuff going on with Quest. So, you know, the important thing is that that, training can be monitored it can be prescribed and it can be monitored and that then allows us to be a bit more multi multimodal in how we do that and take advantage of, of some of the cool things that are going on talking of the cool things that are going on um how do you view the current fervor i think it's the right word to use about ai uh, that seems to be gripping the the industry and all industries at, at the moment do you kind of think, well, you know, sit back and watch this for a while because it's not going to hit our industry for a few years yet? Or is there stuff in there that that is affecting you straight away? Well, we're, yeah, it's an area that we've been monitoring um, for a long, a long time. And I think it's it's ideal really for us um, because of that consultancy piece that I was sort of explaining to, you, you know, that ability to be able to sort of advise and to be able to study what's happening in the data and that kind of thing so for us to have tools that enable us to spot patterns and and sort of fill in that you know there's a lot of data in our industry and a lot of focus on like like there is everywhere but but i think it's really uh really exploded in in maritime and i think what we're lacking as an industry is is the people who can make sense of that data and actually t- you know what is the action that i need to take you know it's one thing to give someone a exhaustive report and here's everything that happened but what is that data telling me and what do i need to do in my business so so from my point of view um that's that's the bit that excites me is the bit that we that we can be much we can kind of make it work in terms of because we we can't build we don't we're not a consultancy we don't charge for consultancy this is something that we do as part of the service to our customers to ensure that they get a good experience from it but it's it's very human being dependent and so it's limited in terms of what you can do in terms of scaling that so 
tools that enable us i wouldn't delegate you know for what we do at the moment i think it, it's safety critical stuff so we would never delegate that to to a some lines of code somewhere um but it, if it can help us to interpret that data and to present that data in a more, more meaningful ways and to actually kind of guide people's actions you know some very good examples of where we've been using it for a while we we, we use an ai proctored service for taking the tests if people want that extra level of security and that just again that doesn't say this person was cheating or not but it will flag things that it considers to be a little bit strange uh, that session's recorded and so somebody could then go in and investigate that pinpoint that and see um see what was going on there so th- these are these are sort of very simple applications i think of it it's a way of kind of for us of of making a difficult job more manageable so we we're 100 percent focused on it uh, if you ask about my personal um feelings about it is i think what's worrying me a little bit is the level of trust that people automatically are assigning to this you know people are using myself included are using chat gpt but i'm using it very cautiously and very advisedly um you know, some people seem to be wholesale, just assuming that it's 100% trustworthy. But it, it seems to me, for example, ChatGPT is very keen to please. <laughs> and so it quite often will fill in gaps creatively where uh, so it kind of it appears to have sort of authority, but it doesn't actually stand up. And of course, it's only as good as the, the data that you put in there as well. And so I think that's one of the other challenges for Maritime. I started out by saying what a big industry it is, but it's overall, it's quite a small I- industry. And so uh, compared to a lot of other so, so there's automatically less information from which to draw from to draw parallels and that kind of thing so so i'm not quite sure how the those models will evolve whether they'll have enough data in a lot of circumstances to be able to to really you know meaningfully say what's going on really interesting answer um we, we've got to close out now um what for me has been a really interesting in- interview. Um, we will put your links and uh, so forth on in, in the show notes so that people can know where to follow you. But I'm interested in where you look to get your knowledge of new developments and ideas in learning tech, particularly as you're kind of slightly divorced from the main, mainstream, so to speak. Um, but both mm. within the sector you're in and in the mainstream, where what are the sources you look to? Um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the sector that we're in, obviously as the as the leader in the space, you know we're, we're expected to you know to to have the answers rather than to be uh, to be out looking for them. And we're in most of the forums, I think, where where the, the the good discussions are happening. So very often for me, in terms of where I'm looking to get new ideas and where I'm, uh, it's it's very much sort of individual thought leaders, really, some people who are doing interesting work. Um, you mentioned Shell, for example, you know, uh, we, quite often customers are an inspiration in terms of what they're doing and then looking at how we would then um, be inspired by by that. So some years back, you know, they were the ones that pioneered reflective learning and then that became a staple approach that we that we took um, in our business. So um, so so, yeah, as I said, mostly it's kind of there's a few individuals that I follow that I think are interesting and have uh, interesting things to say. And then, of course, the customer uh, engagement is is pretty much constant so we're always hearing about I- I- interesting things the the mainstream one i i don't get the time that i i used to to attend shows like learning technologies i used to go to two or three shows a year and I, and i would find those really valuable they would then sort of fuel me up with a whole bunch of ideas which would get people in the team to look at and stuff but I, as i say i don't get to those as often as i do so I, I i rely quite heavily on people like yourself and your your excellent podcast um that's you know, the right answer. Yeah, <laughs> got got a, uh, people like Sam Watts. I don't know if you know Sam, but Sam Sam's a friend very of mine. Well, yeah. he, he, he's you know he he's all over VR, AI, XR. So I know that if there's anything interesting happening there, I can I can tap him uh, for that. And um, so yeah, just so mostly it's about sort of you know connecting with 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 peers and 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 people like that to to stay abreast of things. And I think from from my immediate focus right now, I'd, I'd say I've pivoted more from looking at the sort of production elements of e-learning because that was my background was in creating content and stuff, e-learning content and associated technologies and so on. And I think I've pivoted a little bit more in my interest now to a more broader look at sort of, you know, organizational change and 
how people are kind of getting the most from their workforce and how they inspire them, how they get people to engage, how they get everyone facing forward and, and, and performing in their roles. And I think learning is a massive part of that, but I think it's much more interesting to look at it in that dimension and say, well, what are the other things in here that support that? And I'm also very inspired by the idea of, of, informal learning and the, the sort of things that happen so i'm always looking there to sort of see you know how are people actually learning acquiring skills and so on and not all of that at the moment sits in the e-learning space thank you very much it, it, it's been a, a great interview for me very really interesting uh and i hope as well for for all the listeners and thanks for coming along and taking the time my absolute pleasure thank you very much for having me that's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship and your Patreon contributions. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. And you can contribute at patreon.com forward slash learning hack. That was the last in the current season of the Learning Hack podcast, but we'll be back in the autumn with new seasons of both Learning Hack and Great Minds on Learning too. But watch out for bonus content on our Patreon channel. So until then, stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it.